We come now to the 37 study period here at the camp in British Columbia 1983. This is the 330 study, was well, almost 4 o'clock study period on Sabbath afternoon and really constitutes the final study of our camp time together. It's hard to believe that uh, just over a week ago we began and time has gone by so rapidly I'm sure we'll all agree. We we'll now move on to the next chapter in the book Desire of Ages and the next chapter in the Gospel of John, John the fourth chapter, a uh, fifth chapter rather, John chapter five. And this is the very wonderful story of the healing of the impotent man at the pool of Bethesda. A chapter, of course, that we've spent a great deal of time on in past years. Of course, I'm uh, missing one chapter, which is the chapter called Except You See Signs of Wonders, because we spent time on that earlier in the week, and I don't want to go back and repeat that, that all over again today. Now, we'll look at uh, some aspects of the story which have not engaged our attention previously, so it comes to us fresh and new, I hope, this afternoon. John chapter 5, beginning with verse 1, which says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is a Jerusalem by the sheep market of Pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of, the, of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. We'll go thus far for the moment because I want to make some comments on uh, the information contained in these verses so far. Now, mm, there is no question about the fact that there was a pool, it had five porches and it was by the sheep markets. But there was a very, very... There was, there was equal certainty that no real healings were ever experienced as a result of this teaching or this troubling of the pool. And that, that becomes very apparent by the fact that um, there would assemble at the pool all kinds of sick folk from, and some of them were desperate cases. One desperate case, of course, was this impotent man who hadn't walked for 38 years, and certainly a man in tremendous need. There also came people with blindness and all other kinds of maladies and they waited poised on the edge of the pool together with people who were hardly sick at all, if they were sick at all. You imagine that some very fit folk with imagined diseases would be there as well, selfishly seeking for deliverance from mi some minor ailment. And when the um, water was troubled, who do you suppose always got there first? The fittest and least needy, right? Now, if a person had a bit of a, some light complaint, was to jump in there and in, in, in the excitement uh, be exhilarated by the fact he made it first of all. He'd leap out of the pool, jump up and down with joy and would give the impression of course he'd been healed when he hadn't been, when there'd be nothing to heal anyway. Now furthermore, the suggestion that this was the work of God is completely repudiated by the fact that God doesn't work that way. The whole system was designed to generate selfishness and therefore unholiness it was a system which would encourage the, um, which, which encourage folks to think only of themselves instead of they're all, instead of they're all saying, well, now who is the most needy person in our midst? Let's take him down there and the moment that the water is troubled, let's all stand back and let him get in there first. That, that just wasn't done. Whereas, of course, if the spirit of, of love and the spirit of Christ had pervaded the crowd, that's exactly what they would have done. Isn't that right? Given, given the given the opportunity to the most needy and sick person who was there. Now very obviously then the whole thing was a false legend or a false teaching invented by the enemy of souls to hold people in ignorance and superstition so they would not be able to uh, reach out and, or at least the real truth would be held in disrepute and rejected. And it's by no mean accident that the whole thing is by the sheep market. Now sheep are symbolic, and what do sheep symbolise? God's children, right? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow after me. And David, of course, used the imagery of the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Christ spoke in the parable, called the good shepherd, when he said, I am the good shepherd, and talked about... Um, that the good sheep entered by the door but the, but the wolves and the thieves come over the wall to, to pillage and plunder the sheep and so sheep 
are very definitely a symbol of God's people and uh, candidates for salvation. Now, in a sheep market, such as, such as that beside the pool of Bethesda, sheep were bought and sold into slavery, some to be slaughtered, some, of course, to work as uh, wool producers out in the fields, but they were sold into slavery. And just as at the sheep market, Sheep were sold into slavery, so at the pool, men had been sold into slavery. Men and women, women had been sold into slavery. In other words, the picture in the sheep market was an exact picture at the pool. One in the animal kingdom, and therefore an object lesson, and the other in the human kingdom, and therefore the, the, the lesson to which the object lesson pointed. <clears throat> now, there was at this pool, of course, as we shall now read, a man who had been there for the long space of 38 years. Let's read verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming another step at down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked and on the same day was the Sabbath. I'm going to pass over the miraculous healing rather quickly because as I said we've dealt with that so many times before. We've seen in that a very exact picture of the healing ministry of Jesus Christ and um, the way from bondage to freedom. However, I will touch on it briefly because there are some folk here I'm sure who have not heard the original studies on this point. And I think we all could possibly do with a quick revision of it. <clears throat> this, this story, of course, tells the lesson of faith very beautifully. Now, just to make a graphic presentation, here are the steps that led down to the water's edge, and here is the water in the pool. And here, shall we say, was the impotent man as he lay there upon his bed of pain day by day, waiting for that water to be, be agitated. But, well, of course, around him were dozens of people crowding the porches, likewise waiting, waiting, waiting. Now, many, many times the friends of this man had come and they had sat there patiently with him till the troubling of the waters, and then they had quickly rushed him down to the water, but he got there too late, had come back to try again, again, and to fail, and to try and to fail. So his was a real Roman seven experience of try and fail, try and fail, try and fail. And after years and years of attempting to get deliverance in this fashion, the man had come to the point where he had lost all faith in that system or in that way of deliverance. Now that's a very, very significant point because um, as Jesus said, many, they, they sought out many ways of salvation or many inventions instead of coming to the one way of salvation which was through Jesus Christ himself. We've learned, of course, in the Romans 7 experience that uh, it is when we come to the point where we give up faith in that way, the way called the Romans 7 experience, of trying to make the old thorn bush produce apples, that's the point of time when Jesus Christ at last can come to us and help us. Now, this man was an object lesson of a sinner bound by the cords of sin. Now we've talked about the fact that um, our problem is what is in us or what we are rather than what we have done. We talked about that during the week. We talked about the spirit of disobedience being the controlling or governing factor in a person's life. Now when we look at this man, we see in him a clear picture of the sinner's plight. That man has a physical body. Put these three points down. The man had a physical body. He had an intellectual mind. And he also had, in, in, that mind, or in that body, he had a disease. Now, it was God's intention, of course, that the mind should be the king or the guiding power in the body, right? What your, what your mind or your will, the mind which is also the area of the will, that should be the, the decision center of the, of the human being. But what was the decision center in this man's life? That disease. That's what controlled him. And when in his mind he would like to have got up and walked and worked and uh, married and had a family and carried out the functions of everyday living, he could not do what he wished to do or willed to do because the disease in him dictated otherwise. 
and that disease dictated he should remain upon a bed of sickness impotent for 38 years now this disease remember was in him it was in him and it was the master of him now in like manner we're sinners and uh, as sinners of course we likewise have a body a physical human body we likewise have an intellectual mind but in us there dwells sin which is a master it is in us and it is a master which rules over us against our will and that sin as we have seen earlier in the week of course is, is that other spirit that entered into Adam and Eve back in the Garden of Eden we call it the spirit of disobedience the spirit of pride the spirit of um, untruthfulness or deceit and so on but basically it's called the spirit of disobedience and that spirit of disobedience controls us against our will now when we try as that man ba did back there to get healing by a way other than that which God has provided we naturally meet with failure again and again and again as that man likewise did but there comes at last a time, if we are seeking for God's salvation, there comes at last a time when the Lord is able to, um, to reveal to us his power, just as with the woman at the well at Sychar in the land of Samaria, our faith grasped that power and deliverance come. Now let's see how deliverance came to this man back there. Jesus came to him and said, Wilt thou be made whole? And what was his reply? He said, Lord, let's read the exact words again in John the 5th chapter, verse 7, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. So the man's answer literally was, Sir, I thank you very much for your kind offer, because the man thought that Christ had come to put him in the water, as the others have tried to do he said Lord it's no use I have no more faith in that way or that system and I know that if I try it again while well, I'm even trying to stir myself the quick and fit ones will be down there before me and so I missed my opportunity so that man confessed in very plain terms that that way did not work and he had no more faith in that way whatsoever now when that man confessed then the helplessness of his situation that he could not save himself then Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. Now in this case, there was, there was no special need for Christ to tell that man he had a need because that man knew he had a need, didn't he? 38 years was enough to convince him that he had a desperate need and furthermore, that he was totally helpless to save himself and you recognize a parallel between this, of course, and the woman at the well. Now when Jesus said to, her, to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk, the pronouncement of those words was a revelation to that man of power. The same as the words to the woman at the well when Christ said, I that speak unto thee am he, namely the Messiah, was to her a revelation of power. And the same as when he spoke to the man in the previous chapter, in the woman now studying in Desire of Ages, except you see signs and wonders you will not believe, that was also the word of power. And you'll recall, of course, I read to you from the book Ministry of Healing, page 122, I think it was 122, that uh, it is in these promises that Christ communicates to us of his grace and power. In other words, the power of God is in the word of God. 122 is the correct reference, ministry of healing. <clears throat> so when Christ said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk, that was a transmission or the revelation of power to that man. And that man believed the word of Jesus Christ and believing that word, he stood upon his feet and in acting upon the word of God, God gave the power and that man was made whole in that moment of time. And so, of course, the same thing will be true in our experience when we likewise recognize our great need, lay hold upon the living promises of God, claim those promises by faith and possess them, and then by faith act upon the promise of God, then we're going to find the same deliverance will be experienced by us as well as by him. <clears throat> now, as I said, we'll move on now quickly to the next aspect of the story, namely that um, this miracle was performed upon the Sabbath day. Now, Jesus Christ could very easily have performed this miracle on some other day than the Sabbath day, but he deliberately chose that day 
because it was necessary to provoke a, a, a discussion of his work and ministry and for the Jews to be forced to examine more closely just what he was upon this earth to do. Now, for instance, um, if we come to page 203, perhaps I should just... Uh, uh, yeah, I'll read the second last paragraph. The restored paralytic stooped to take up his bed, which was only a rug and a blanket. And as he straightened himself again with a sense of delight, he looked around for his deliverer, but Jesus was lost in the crowd. The man feared that he would not know him if he should see him again. As he hurried on his way with firm, free step, praising God and rejoicing in his newfound strength, he met several of the Pharisees and immediately told them of his cure. He was surprised at the coldness with which they listened to his story. Now we're still very early, of course, in the ministry of Christ. We've... Uh, just a couple of chapters back is the story of the cleansing of the temple which was, which was when he announced his mission then the meeting with Nicodemus which was just a night um, meeting then the difficulty with, um, with, the, uh, with John the Baptist's disciples then the journey north when he, when he stayed at Jacob's well for two days and the next chapter which we just passed over of course deals with the miracle at Cana and now we find him back at Jerusalem again in the south. So the ministry of Christ has only just begun, maybe a few weeks of age at, at the very most, or maybe a month perhaps, but not very long. <coughs> and uh, here was Christ um, deliberately, of course under God's command, throwing out a challenge or throwing down a gauntlet to the Pharisees and the leaders of Israel in regard to the question of the Sabbath day and the miracle working power of Jesus Christ. Now, is the Sabbath day a day of very special significance in the work of Christ and in the belief of God's folk today? It certainly is. It is a necessity without which, of course, the work of God cannot be successfully carried forward or the people of God remain in close connection with him. Now, I'd like you to go across to page 283 and here is a chapter devoted to the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, that special day when God has appointed himself as our companion and teacher in order to give to us the true appreciation of his character and to enable us to serve him and to attain his blessings and power. Let's read now a couple of paragraphs on this page to uh, gain this message. The Sabbath was not for Israel merely but for the world. It had been made known to man in Eden and like the other precepts of the Decalogue, it is an imperishable obligation. <coughs> of that law of which the, sa the fourth commandment forms a part, Christ declares, For heaven and earth pass, one jot of one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. So long as the heavens and the earth endure, the Sabbath will continue, continue as a sign of the Creator's power. And when Eden shall bloom on earth again, God's holy rest day will be honoured by all beneath the sun. From one Sabbath to another, the inhabitants of the glorified new earth shall go up to worship before me, saith the Lord. No other institution which was committed to the Jews tended to tend so fully to distinguish them from surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. God designed that its observance should designate them as his worshippers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. Through faith they must become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. When the command was given to Israel, remember the, seventh, the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the Lord said also to them, You shall be holy men unto me. Only thus could the Sabbath distinguish Israel as the worshippers of God. Now, of course, when, when we come down to the days of Jesus Christ, the Pharisees had long since ceased to be holy men and women, right? They were rebellious, they were apostate, and they were very unholy, very cruel, very rapacious, and they were murderous. In fact, they committed the most serious murder of all human history. They crucified the Son of God himself. So the Pharisees then were long or far removed from true Sabbath keeping. Yet did they observe the seventh day of the week as a rest day? Right, so they were seventh day keepers. They were not Sabbath keepers in any sense of the word whatsoever. 
because they were not holy men. Now today, of course, the Seventh-day Adventist Church regards themselves as being a very distinct people by virtue of their Sabbath-keeping, don't they? Yes. However, if you think about it, they're not the only Sabbath-keeping body on the face of the earth. About ten years ago, the Bible Sabbath Association in America here, or down in America, I was still in America up here, pardon me, you Canadians. <laughs> it's all seems like one country to me. But down in the States, the Bible Sabbath Association, which I think is sent out, out in Oklahoma, <coughs> Um, published a list of at least at that time at least 30 Sabbath keeping bodies in the United States of America alone at least 30 there's the Seventh-day Adventist Church of course the Seventh-day Adventist Reformed Churches there's Herbert of, Herbert of Armstrong's Bible Sabbath um, uh, Radio Church of God plus a whole list of other little organizations and I'm quite sure that the Bible Sabbath Association didn't know them all now, is it possible that every one of these Seventh-day Observing organizations is the Church of God? That's impossible. Some of them, for instance, have the most uh, well erroneous positions. Armstrong, for instance, um, subscribes to the thousand years of peace upon this earth doctrine. He doesn't believe we're born again till Christ returns. He denies the new birth experience today. And it's impossible for such a person to have a true Sabbath keeping because his message denies the possibility of present holiness so then today as back in the days of Jesus Christ the Sabbath was not able to distinguish God's people excepting the people themselves were a holy people let's just pick out the main points again in this last paragraph which I've just read it says in order to keep the Sabbath holy men must themselves be holy and that, the, the emphasis on the word be, which means a state of being, not just of doing. And holiness, of course, is obedience and faith. So therefore they had to be an obedient people and a faithful people. Now the kind of obedience which is required in this matter of holiness is that which springs from a righteousness within and a mental acceptance of the fact that we do the work as God d directs it shall be done, not as we think it might or ought to be done. So we read here, through faith they must become partakers of the righteousness of Christ. So when Jesus Christ then, we'll go back now to page 203 in the book Desire of Ages, when Jesus Christ then deliberately chose the Sabbath day, so revered by the Jews and wished to perform this miracle, was he not raising the issue of holiness and working to give to those Jews a recognition of how far they were away from the true spirit of righteousness and from the ways of God and to reveal to them therefore their need to become Sabbath keepers in fact, a thing which of course they were not at that point of time. Now Christ knew perfectly well when he said to the man, Rise, take up your bed and walk, that he was telling the man to do something which was not a violation of Sabbath keeping, but which would be viewed by the Jews as such. And, and Christ knew perfectly well he couldn't walk more than, shall we say, a few hundred steps before he ran into some Pharisees. Christ also knew the man would glowingly tell them of what he just experienced and ex expecting them to rejoice with him. And Christ then knew they would know who'd done the miracle. And he also knew they would haul him in before the Sanhedrin and this would give him a marvellous opportunity to lay out before those men the duplicity of their course of action and to give them the opportunity to recognise him as the Messiah and the Saviour of the world. So we now read on page 203, with lowering brows they, that is the Pharisees, interrupted him asking him why he was carrying his bed upon the Sabbath day. They sternly reminded him that it was not lawful to bear burdens on the Lord's day. In his joy, the man had forgotten that it was the Sabbath. Hmm. Yet, he had, did he, yet he felt no condemnation for obeying the command of one who had such power from God. He answered boldly, He that made me whole, the same said to me, Take up thy bed and walk. Of course, that really now is, uh, as we say, putting the fat in the fire, wasn't it? It was really stirring up the blaze. They asked him who it was that had done this, but he could not tell. These rulers knew well that only one had shown himself able to perform this miracle, but they wished for direct proof that it was Jesus, that they might condemn him as a Sabbath breaker. In their judgment, he had not only broken the law in healing the sick man upon the Sabbath, 
but has committed sacrilege in bidding him bear away his bed. And what a pathetic religion, when you think about it. Cold and uh, lifeless and stiff and, and rigid and destructive. No wonder the man forgot this. I think so, yes, no wonder. <laughs> and the next paragraph um, tells us um, about the perversion of the Jewish, uh, that they made the Sabbath and... Um, I think this paragraph is worth reading because it does show us again how inconsistent the Jews were in their position. The Jews have so perverted the law that they made it a yoke of bondage. Their meaningless requirements have become a byword amongst other nations. Especially was the Sabbath hedged in by all manner of senseless restrictions. It was not that they made the light, the holy of the Lord, and honourable. The scribes and Pharisees have made its observance an intolerable burden. A Jew is not allowed to kindle a fire nor even to light a candle upon the Sabbath. As a consequence, the people were dependent upon the Gentiles for many services which their rules forbade them to do for themselves. They did not reflect that, that if these acts were sinful, those who employed others to perform them were as guilty as if they had done the work themselves. They thought that salvation was restricted to the Jews and that the condition of all others being already hopeless could, not, could be made no worse. But God has given no commandment. God has given no commandments which cannot be obeyed by all His laws, sanction no reason or selfish restrictions. <laughs> As I said before, it is, it is a very strange thing that uh, the Jews will do this. Now, for instance, if um, even today an Orthodox Jew, if he turns the lights on before the sun goes down on. Uh, Friday afternoon or has the radio blurring all kinds of bad music before the sun goes down on Friday afternoon he will not turn it off till after the Sabbath is over no matter what disturbance it may create in, in the household and they have no compunction of course about getting Gentiles so called to do their services for them to do things that they themselves won't do upon that day small wonder then that the Gentiles look with um, well that they despise the Jew because because it's obvious that this thing is, is unreasonable, illogical and, and, and irreligious to say the least of it. Now, Christ did not try and hide himself. He had not told the man who he was and had slipped away before the man could recognise him and thank him. But after the man had met the Pharisees and then had gone down to the temple because it was the Sabbath day, he said, well, I better go to church today. After he pulled away his bed, then Christ met the man again, as we now read on page 204. In the temple, Jesus met the man who had been healed. He had come to bring a, a sin offering and also a thank offering for the great mercy he had received. Finding him among the worshippers, Jesus made himself known with the warning words, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest thy worst thing come upon thee. The healed man was overjoyed at meeting his deliverer. Ignorant of the enmity toward Jesus, he told the Pharisees who had questioned him that this was he who had performed the cure. Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he'd done these things on the Sabbath day. And now comes the great confrontation because the Jews now brought Christ before the Sanhedrin to answer the charge of Sabbath breaking. <coughs> As we now read, <clears throat> Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin to answer the charge of Sabbath breaking. Now what again was the Sanhedrin? It was the most powerful body in the Jewish nation. And even though the powers were limited by Roman occupation, the Sanhedrin was still a very consequential body of men who uh, had, had a lot of power and influence in the nation of Israel. And now Sister White says here, if Israel had been a free nation they would, have, they would have certainly put Christ to death at this time had the Jews at this time been an independent nation such a charge would have served their purpose for putting him to death this their subjection to the Romans prevented the Jews had not the power to inflict capital punishment and the accusations brought against Christ would have, would have no weight in the Roman court there were other objects however which they hoped to secure Notwithstanding their efforts to c counteract his work, Christ was gaining, even in Jerusalem, an influence over the people greater than their own. Multitudes who were not interested in the harangue of the rabbis were attracted by his teaching. They could understand his words and their hearts were warmed and comforted. He spoke of God, not as an avenging judge, but as a tender father, and he revealed the image of God as mirrored in himself. 
His words were like balm to the wounded spirit. Both by his words and by his works of mercy, he was breaking the oppressive power of the old traditions and man-made commandments and presenting the love of God in his, exhaust, in his exhaustless fullness. Now, what was the principal concern of these Pharisees? They were losing power, right? They were decreasing. What was Christ doing? Increasing. Now, do we find that these men possessed the same holy spirit of submission and recognition of their rightful position that John the Baptist possessed? No. They didn't, did they? Not for one moment. Now, as a matter of fact, if the Sanhedrin had truly understood through the divine principles, in other words, if we were members of that, of that council today, and at the same time we understood how that council came into being, there was the child of unbelief on Moses' part, that while they'd done some good things to begin with had become a, uh, a menace to God's cause later, then what would we do today if we were in that kind of position and knew, knew what we now know? What, what would we do? We'd abolish the thing, wouldn't we? Get rid of it. It, it was just a, uh, a, a source of human power that uh, pitted itself against the powers of God. So those men did not understand their true position and their true position or responsibility was to get rid of that Sanhedrin altogether and to let Jesus Christ increase while they decreased. That would be a good thing, a very good thing. But there was no mind in those men, there was no spirit in those men to let Jesus Christ increase while they decreased. No spirits of that nature whatsoever. On the contrary, they would go to any lengths that, that were necessary to silence the voice of Jesus and put him to death they would certainly have done if they had the power to do it. So how, how entirely different was their spirit and attitude from that of John the Baptist. So totally different. And of course, likewise, so totally different their fate. How many of those Pharisees today are up in heaven with John? Not one of them. Not one of them. Now of course, um, Nicodemus was there and he, he was, his was a different spirit. But he didn't have very much voice in so large a council and I'm sure he sat there very quietly while Christ was more than able to defend the principles of God's truth as uh, he stood before them. Right? So as we read that um, the people could understand his words and uh, he was breaking the oppressive power of the old traditions and man-made commandments and presenting the love of God in his exhaustless fullness. Now we, we noted the other day that Jesus Christ came in the fullness of time. In other words, he could not come to this earth until wickedness had reached its height because he had the important work to do to reveal the character of God in contrast to the character of Satan. And therefore Satan's character had to be developed to its very worst so that Christ could show God's character as very best. And this contrast of one of his best and the other his very worst showed both of them, of course, in the fullest and brightest possible light. But at the same time, this made Christ's other work very difficult namely the work of penetrating the darkness which surrounded human minds and establishing righteousness in the world, within the hearts of men. That It made that part of Christ's work extremely difficult. And of course it meant he had the worst possible opposition to his work and um, uh, it seems to me that things could not have been more difficult for him than they were as he tried to change the hearts of men from pride to humility. Hmm. now let's go a little further then to see what the purpose now of the Sanhedrin was and how they would go about it in one of the earliest prophecies of Christ it is written the scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a Lord giver from between his feet until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be the people were gathering to Christ the sympathetic uh, hearts of the multitude accepted lessons of love and benevolence <coughs> in preference to the rigid ceremonies required by the priests. If the priests and rabbis had not interposed, his teaching would have, re would have wrought such a reformation as this world has never witnessed. Now, you read that statement before? I read it before, and it's always impressed me very, very greatly. Page 205 in the book Desire of Ages. Let's read the words again. If the priests and rabbis had not interposed, that is, if they stood back and simply let the people alone and let them accept the teachings of Christ if they wanted to, then Christ's teaching would have wrought such a reformation as this world has never witnessed. Now then, what a 
what a, um, a responsibility rests upon those men for what they did. When they shut away from the world, the light which they themselves did not want, they could have said, oh, we don't want that light, but if the people want to let them have it, that's their business. But there was a price to be paid because if they let the people have what the people wanted, what price did the Pharisees then have to pay? The loss of prestige, the loss of power, and the loss of position. And were they in any mind to pay that kind of price? <coughs> Unholy people are never in any kind of mind to pay that sort of price. As the very next sentence says, but in order to maintain their own power, these leaders determined to break down the influence of Jesus. Which, of course, is a very, dis uh, very despicable and pitiful attitude to, on, to take on their part. His arraignment before the Sanhedrin and an open condemnation of his teachings would aid in effecting this, for the people still had great reverence for their religious leaders. Whoever dared to condemn the rabbinical requirements or attempt to, list, to lighten the burdens they had brought upon the people was regarded as guilty, not only of blasphemy, but of treason. On this ground, the rabbis hoped to excite suspicion of Christ. They represented him as trying to overthrow the established customs, thus causing division amongst the people and preparing the way for complete subjugation by the Romans. Now, there, there is another factor, of course. While the immediate uh, motivation upon these men was the retention of their own power and position, they also did these things because they were in the grip of another power, that is the power of Satan. And of course Satan excited their fears and made them zealous to protect what they believed to be the work of God, but which in fact was the work of Satan. The next paragraph says that, but the plans which these rabbis were working so zealously to fulfill originated in another council than that of the Sanhedrin. After Satan had failed to overcome Christ in the wilderness, he combined his forces to oppose him in his ministry and if possible to thwart his work. What he could not accomplish by direct personal effort, he, may, he determined to effect by strategy. No sooner had he withdrawn from the conflict in, in the wilderness than in counsel with his confederate angels, he matured his plans for still further blinding the minds of the Jewish people that they might not recognize their Redeemer. He planned to work through his human agencies in the religious world by imbuing men with his own enmity against the champion of truth. He would lead them to reject Christ and to make his life as bitter as possible, hoping to discourage him in his mission. And the leaders in Israel became instruments of Satan in warring against the Saviour. The Jews in Jerusalem thought they were building up whose work? God's work. But the point is, they went about the building of God's work in what fashion or in what way? Man's way. And of course it was that disposition which had caused their bondage to the Romans in the first case. They had determined to build up um, God's work after their own ideas and the further they went in that the more it became their own ideas and less and less of God's work until it became an, in the end Satan's work entirely and only. And the, the, there was need of course to uproot this thing from its very beginning in order to um, make a fresh start. Now, we have many examples in the, um, in the Bible of where if men had been the plan makers they would have done things very, very differently from the way in which God would do them. And here's one more such example in this story. Let's read the next paragraph or so, page 206 in Desire of Ages. Jesus had come to magnify the law and to make it honourable. He is not to lessen his dignity but to exalt it. The scripture says he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth. Isaiah 42, 21 and verse 4. He had come to free the Sabbath from those burdens and requirements which had made it a curse instead of a blessing. For this reason he had chosen the Sabbath upon which to perform the act of healing at Bethesda. He could have healed the sick man as well on any other day of the week or he might simply have cured him without bidding him bear away his bed, but this would not have given him the opportunity he desired. A wise purpose underlay every act of Christ's life on earth. Everything he did was, was important in itself and in his teaching. Among the afflicted ones at the pool, he selected the worst case upon which to exercise his power, upon whom to exercise his power, and bade the man carry his bed to the city in 
order to publish the great work that had been brought upon him. This would raise the question of what it was lawful to do upon the Sabbath and would open the way for him to denounce the restrictions of the Jews in regard to the Lord's Day and to declare their traditions void. Now, <clears throat> think now, of course, um, about the consequences of this daring act um, on the part of Jesus Christ. And the consequences were rather considerable. For instance, if we go across to the end of the chapter, we find um, how considerable they were. If I just find the uh, statement again quickly, it tells us that uh, spies were set upon the track of Jesus Christ to follow him where, wherever he went. Yes, it's the very last paragraph. It says they have signally failed to, to subvert the authority of Jesus or, or to alienate the respect and attention of the people, many of whom were convi convi convicted by his words. The rulers themselves had felt deep condemnation as he had pressed their, their guilt home upon their consciences, yet this only made them the more bitter against him. They were determined to take his life. They sent messengers all over the country to warn the people against Jesus as an imposter. Spies were sent to watch him and report what he said and did. The precious Saviour was now most surely standing under the shadow of the cross. As we said, only the first few weeks of the first year of his ministry had, had gone by and Christ is already under threat of death. Now, let's suppose today that um, we are, are commissioned of God to go out and preach the gospel. And as Jesus did back there, we have a very clear understanding of the opposition that, that finds a deep-seated deep base in the hearts of leading uh, theologians and teachers and so forth now for instance if um, we came into a new town and we're going to run a, hold some kind of evangelistic campaign would we in our plans decide to have a straight out confrontation with the most powerful religious leaders in the town and get them right against us so they use television radio and newspapers to denounce us is that the kind of move we'd make it isn't and yet that's the exact kind of move that Jesus made by deliberately hearing that man upon the Sabbath day and ordering him or directing him to walk to the streets of Jerusalem carrying his bed upon the Sabbath day there is nothing better calculated than that to set against him the combined anger of the religious leaders of his day and yet that's what he did now God knew what he was doing when God commissioned Christ to do that and Christ didn't ask any questions didn't conjecture as to the success of his work he simply said what are my orders and went ahead and did them. And we have to learn too that no matter how illogical the commands of God may appear to us, no matter how dangerous they may seem, no matter how much they may appear to go against good sense and good strategy, we are to obey those commands no matter what the cost may be. Jesus did, and while I, I kind of uh, even shudder at the effect of that bold move upon his part, and the, the wrath of the Pharisees generated against him, yet in the long run, the work did undermine the strength of the, of the rabbinical laws and rules and did give people greater confidence to turn away from those restrictions to keep the Sabbath as it should have been kept. Now this was the holy day of the week, the seventh day Sabbath, and Christ upon that day gave a demonstration of what true holiness is in the form of fearless obedience to God's commands, doing what God directed him to do, even though it meant standing before the highest council in the land of Israel and bringing against him the enmity of the Pharisees. Now, as we come to the end of our camp meeting, let's just remember that um, to the Philadelphian church, the people through whom the final work will be done, there is a need to rise to the heights of holiness, which, as we have seen, of course, are obedience and faith. We will ask only two questions. What are my orders and what are the promises? Knowing these, we have to obey the one and to trust the other. And those who learn to do this, to them the Holy Spirit should be given without measure. And I'm sure we all go away from this camp with a great determination to do just that, to learn what our orders are and to obey them, to learn what the promises are and to believe them, and then to receive more and more of the infilling of God's Spirit day by day, in preparation for the full outpouring of the latter rain and the finishing of God's work in the near future. 
May God bless you each one to gain a rich experience in the coming months as my prayer today. Any questions you'd like to ask before we take our closing hymn? Yeah, can you stay the whole year? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is